everybody to the 2026 Data Edge Conference. It's great to be here after all this time. <laughs> and uh, I, I really appreciate you all playing along. I'm obviously wearing 2016 clothing. A lot of you are as well. It's nice to kind of get into this historic moment, have some historic accuracy here. So, you know, we're going to have a look back at the last 10 years and see how, how we got to where we are from back in 2016 when people started thinking maybe the data, you know, this... Uh, revolution caused by deep learning might be, might be something that's on the agenda. Uh, everything that I'm going to show today is actual examples of actual technology that was uh, documented and displayed back in 2016, so this is all going to be historically accurate. Um, <laughs> uh, and, you know, let's start by talking about the the, the kind of the big goal, the, the big goal back from 1954 when Arthur Samuels first invented machine learning, this idea that we could get computers to solve problems for us if we just give them examples of what we want, has been a way of having machines learn that is as flexible as possible, ideally an infinitely flexible function that could learn anything at all, and then some way of fitting any one of those functions or any given inputs and to do so in a fast and scalable way. That was always the, the goal of people in machine learning. And in the 90s in particular, there was a hope that perhaps the, the neural network, which is an a algorithm, a, a functional form that had been around since the 60s, perhaps could be this approach. Um, in the 90s, the neural network was a single hidden layer based multi-layer perceptron and um, a very, very simple function which could be trained in the simplest possible way, which is gradient descent. And thanks to Peter Norvig from Google for both of the previous two slides. Um, in, in the 90s, that didn't quite work out as people hoped for a couple of reasons. Um, Really, in the end, it was the, the third box, which is this fast and scalable piece. It turned out that these neural networks trained with gradient descent couldn't solve the most challenging real-world problems in any reasonable amount of time or space. Um, but then, excitingly, in, 19, in the mid-90s, um, Jan LeCun showed something uh, well way ahead of his time, 20 years ahead of his time, which was that a neural network with multiple hidden layers could learn to recognize digits. And this was what he called Lynette 5. This is an actual example of Lynette 5 in use, a system from the mid-90s, which went on to read about 15% of the checks that were written in the United States. For whatever reason, not much happened for the next 20 years or so, despite the fact that Jan LeCun had shown what was possible if we added more layers to a neural network. Um, but then, uh, around 2012 through 2014, people started solving this fast and scalable piece in a big way, uh, particularly by using GPUs, graphics programming units, which were designed to work, uh, um, to, to help you play computer games more quickly. Uh, they were basically linear algebra processes, and deep learning is basically a bunch of matrix matrix products stuck on top of each other, so they turned out to work very well. Um, so in 2014, um, Matt Zeiler and Rob Fergus did something really interesting, which was they trained uh, one of these multi-layer um, networks and then tried to look back and say, what has this network learnt? And they trained it uh, on pictures, and when they looked back at, a, I think it was an 11-layer network, they discovered that layer one had taught itself to recognize kind of edges uh, and some different types of gradients. Um, they discovered that layer two had learnt to find certain types of pattern which were almost always found in sunsets, for example, and another layer which had learnt to discover certain types of patterns which were generally found in flowers, and another one which found certain kinds of patterns which were generally found in um, textures like carpet and so forth. And the interesting thing here was that they realized that as they went up a layer and a layer and a layer, each layer was becoming increasingly sophisticated at recognizing more specific things. So by the time they got to layer three, 
there was a, a node which basically recognized the presence of people. Uh, there was a node that rep recognized the presence of text. And you know, what was exciting about this was that um, none of this was programmed. You know, this was starting out with a, a blank slate, a tabular resi um, of purely random numbers and having it learn to find representations which it could, it, which it could usefully use. And remarkably, it taught itself to break down these image problems into these semantically interesting parts. And then each layer was exponentially more sophisticated than the previous layer. Uh, layers 5 and layers 6 got to the point where it was finding the eyeballs of uh, birds and lizards, for example. And so um, by 2016, uh, these neural networks are up to over a thousand layers deep. So you can get a sense from, you know, w how come these things were able to do so much. What really had made a big difference was when the academic community took up, woke up and took notice of what deep learning could do. And that happened in 2012, really, when um, a machine learning competition on the ImageNet data set, which is about a million um, 224 by 224 pixel photos like these, uh, a deep learning algorithm easily beat uh, all comers and really took, uh, took what had been quite a kind of a flat accuracy curve and suddenly um, smashed it. Um, as soon as most people working in computer vision saw this, they realized that the traditional hand engineered kind of manual approach to computer vision uh, was now in the past. Um, and by 2015, um, uh, a group from uh, uh, China uh, and Microsoft Research had demonstrated the ability to recognize arbitrary photos more accurately than humans could. So it was really, it really was uh, in that kind of 2012 to 2015 that suddenly things kind of took off, particularly in computer vision and particularly in academia. And then we started to see things commercially, funnily enough, or kind of surprisingly enough to people back in those days. Uh, China, which was not necessarily expected to be the first, really were um, at the head of the pack. So Baidu uh, was the company which really had a fantastic deep learning based image search engine up online before anybody else did. And indeed, um, Baidu uh, was responsible for a lot of the most important research and commercial applications uh, in those days. Um, I think, um, you know, really the, the message of this talk is going to be that much as a lot of people were surprised about what happened between 2016 and 2026, they shouldn't have been because all of the information we had to know what was about to happen was all available in 2026. 16, and I'm going to show you that now. So, for example, uh, it, it, things happened very quickly. By 2015, uh, algorithms existed which could look at arbitrary pictures and construct novel sentences about them with a high degree of accuracy. By 2016, algorithms existed that could look at complex photos and identify every object in them with a high degree of accuracy. And these things could work, you know, in roughly real time. Uh, there were uh, examples in 2016 of these, this bottom one being applied to videos um, in real time. So when you kind of see the speed of development from 2012 when, uh, you know, really there were kind of five academic groups in the world who were, you know, bothering to even look at deep learning to 2016 when at least everybody in the computer vision world pretty much had started using deep learning. Things happened very rapidly such that every month, you know, massive new state-of-the-art results were, were being demonstrated. So then the next thing that happened, you know, really during 2015, 2016 was showing that deep learning could do a lot more. That it's not just a way of seeing. Um, so for example, uh, a system was demonstrated in 2016 that showed 50% uh, improvement in predicting infection rates uh, using a deep learning network based on a heart rate uh, time series analysis. 
Uh, there was work that came out of Stanford and Google showing state-of-the-art results using um, multitask neural networks, which is a type of deep learning, at uh, automatic drug discovery. Uh, there were um, huge improvements in the state-of-the-art at identifying the Higgs boson from CERN data. Um, uh, looking at natural language uh, rapidly, uh, deep learning became the state of the art. And so, for example, modeling, uh, looking at anomaly detection in uh, newswire events. Uh, it was used for all kinds of signal data, such as EEG, where state of the art results were uh, found with deep learning, um, at uh, iris recognition, such as for security. Um, for eye detection, such as the facial key points. And, you know, increasingly we found in 2016 that every time somebody pointed deep learning at anything, that was a new state of the art. And this is perhaps not surprising when we think back to, you know, those first five layers that Matt Zeiler and Rob Fergus showed of like how much additional information a single layer of a neural network can create and think that by mid-2016, 1,000 layer networks were increasingly commonplace, you can realize within the 100 billion or so parameters contained in such a network, clearly there is much more sophisticated modeling going on automatically than any human could be expected to do by hand. Um, I think it would be fair to say though that even in the deep learning community, a lot of people were surprised when a deep learning model showed that it could actually predict the outcome of computer programs. Uh, and this was an exciting result which really showed that um, deep learning is a general computational framework. Sometimes it, it was wrong, and interestingly it was wrong in curious ways, so it would be like wrong by a single digit. Um, and a lot of the, you know, naysayers of the kind of second decade of uh, uh, the 20th century, uh, sorry, uh, 21st century, were naysayers because they would find like these little mistakes and say, oh, it's got this little mistake, therefore deep learning's not useful. But of course, you know, the little mistakes would only be around for a month or two and then rapidly the little mistakes would be gone and whatever the next state of the art thing would have some new little mistake. There was uh, not just work being done in prediction, but also in actually um, taking actions. Uh, DeepMind was the most famous for this. They had a, a, a basically a single algorithm that was able to play dozens of different Atari computer games um, and uh, was better than the best human players at most of them. And this is the same basic system that went on very famously to uh, beat the Go world champion in a very, un a, a very unusual event, unusual because the level of hype that it was given was actually deserved, which is very rare when the press covers academic advances. The interesting thing about this is not just that Go is a complex game that computers hadn't won at before, but it was how it did it. You know, this uh, system literally, yes, there was a part of it which was traditional kind of brute force computer techniques of looking at lots of different possible, um, you know, plays that it could make. But the cool bit was when it said, okay, if I made this play, how good is it? The how good is it bit used a convolutional neural network. In other words, it, it, it looked at the board and had a sense of does it look good or not, just like human players do. So like it was a very different way of, you know, compared to say the, um, the Kasparov winning chess computer, which literally was just lots and lots of rules and lots of lots of scoring functions. This really kind of had intuition. Um, you know, nobody could describe why AlphaGo thought that this board looked better than this board. It just does, which indeed is exactly, you know, if you talk to Lee Sodal about why does this board look better than this board, at some point all these great players just say, you know, it's got a better balance or it's got a better feel or, you know, whatever. So that was genuinely a big deal. Um, <laughs> So it wasn't just about games, it wasn't just about medicine, um, but you know, another thing that surprised people was that in 2016, increasingly, it started to get used um, artistically. And you know, as long as I had been talking about data science and machine learning, you know, over 20 years at that point, 
uh, people in the audience always complain to me that you know computers could never be creative um, or you know couldn't bring joy or whatever else but increasingly in 2016 computers did start doing things that looked um, pretty damn impressive um, so this is a um, example of a, a, a free and open source software from 2016 that can combine the style of one picture with the content of another using deep learning. Perhaps more um, fascinatingly, here is one, look at the bottom right, which allowed people to draw a picture and then it would automatically turn it into a painting. So here is the painting that was generated and on the right there was the drawing. And to me, the, th this is interesting because it shows, you know, now here we are in 2026 and everybody's an artist, right? Everybody loves to create new things and create new things with the help of our computers. But this idea that you could use what is in your head and have a computer kind of fill it out the rest of it for you to turn your vision into something um, beautiful was quite new back in 2016. So this idea of kind of um, deep learning as a way of augmenting human creativity I think was maybe the the undercurrent of deep learning that was the least well appreciated back in 2016. Because, you know, this is the thing which lets humans be more human, you know. Um, but we should have known, right? Because uh, we at that point had deep learning systems generating uh, techno drum beats. Um, we had at that point deep learning systems generating novel choreography. Uh, and I'm just going to let this guy sit here for a while because I can't. I can't get enough of him. So <laughs> when this started training, it was a bunch of lines randomly jumping all over the screen. Um, but after 10 hours of training, it uh, starts generating uh, choreography. So, you know, here we are in 2026, and of course, you know, the, 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 the job title choreographer no longer exists because we are now all our own choreographers. Anybody interested in dancing works with their deep learning based creative tool uh, to come up with a dance routine which, you know, they came up with in their head but the algorithm then turned into something, um, you know, cooler than perhaps they could have done. <laughs> I mean, I don't need to give a talk. I could just leave this sitting here <laughs> all day. Um, yeah, so look up deep learning uh, choreography if you want to um, have a lose the rest of your afternoon. Uh, I feel bad about moving to the next slide. Um, okay, sorry. <laughs> we'll we'll come back to it later. Maybe at break we'll leave neuro choreography going on. Um, so you know, yes, you know the the, the choreographer, uh, the concept of the job of the choreographer w was gone. But perhaps more ironic was the job of data scientist was the next to go. Um, you know, data scientists thought that they were the the bee's knees for a while and were making lots of money in places like uh, Silicon Valley. But actually, you know, it was back in 2016 that um, deep learning was used to optimize deep learning architectures and showed much better results than any humans could. Um, uh, also, interestingly, uh, it was shown that actually it didn't even matter that much. Uh, if you took a, uh, this is a paper called CNN Off the Shelf, which showed that if you take a fairly general convolutional neural network, you can apply it to a wide range of other data sets and get state-of-the-art results on each one. Uh, that was shown in computer vision. It was also shown in natural language. Um, I rather like this quote which uh, our secret wish was to discover that it's all hype and count vectors are far superior to their predictive counterparts. So the people who showed that deep learning is incredibly powerful generalization system in NLP were people who were actually trying to show that deep learning was all hype. So, um, so you know, the kind of, the, 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 the period of time where data scientists had these deity-like powers that nobody else could do was really very brief because very quickly deep learning was shown to be much better at data scientists than doing data science. Furthermore, all of the startups and companies which tried to create de you know, deep learning companies didn't last very long either. Um, big companies like Microsoft by 2016 had a full suite of deep learning based APIs which anybody could use um, generally for free for as much as most people would need. Um, so rather than the idea of a 
and deep learning company that didn't last very long. Instead, we started to see a much more pragmatic approach, which is companies doing other things would use deep learning as a tool. Um, in fact, in 2014, I did exactly that myself. I thought about what would medicine look like if people used uh, deep learning as a tool. And I kind of realized that medicine is basically collect some data about a patient, figure out what's wrong with them by looking at that data, figure out what to do about it by looking at that data, and then do the thing. And this whole bit here is data analysis. You know, so when you realize you know, you kind of disaggregate a job that traditionally had been quite very artisanal, like being a doctor, and say, well, you know, how, how would a data scientist think about this? You suddenly realize that at least half of it is just data science. And so the, I started a company called Analytic, which was the first uh, deep learning for medicine company, a lot more followed in the next year or two. Um, and, you know, today in 2026, nobody goes and sees a doctor anymore. We, you know, have our, obviously, uh, devices with us which tell us what's wrong and what to do about it. And we only go and see a doctor at the point that we need to do something about it, not at the earlier points, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, similar things happened, for example, in the 90s with um, getting a loan. You know, it used to be that if you wanted to get a loan, you would have to go and see a lo loan auditor and talk to this person and convince them to give you a loan. And by the late 90s, credit was done entirely automatically and it could be done online. Um, and people stopped thinking about the days to get a loan. They would have to go and convince somebody. Uh, you know, the same kind of thing happens each time computers take over. So the difference with deep learning was that it let computers take over in all of the areas that used unstructured data, not just structured data. So medicine, you know, the data is images, it's sounds, it's complex signals, it's natural language, you know, almost all of the data used to diagnose you is unstructured. Until the days of deep learning, there was really no way to have a computer use that very effectively. Um, so the other thing perhaps we shouldn't have been surprised about was the, uh, the events that led up to the famous riots of 2022, um, <laughs> which, which really we should have seen coming because we, we knew back then that the labor force um, in the developed world was nearly entirely um, service driven. And uh, we, you know, the, the blue areas are, you know, all the areas where money was in the early 21st century. And we knew then what service, services were. Services were doing these kinds of things. And we also knew in 2016 that these kinds of things are exactly the kinds of things that deep learning was as good as or better than humans at increasingly. Uh, so it should have come as no surprise that income inequality became a bigger and bigger problem because it simply got to the point where there wasn't enough useful work to be done. Um, this did, however, come as a surprise to people because people are used to thinking about kind of human development like this. But of course, deep learning development looked like that. And back in 2016, we were there, right? And so it was very hard for people to think about what 2026 looks like, which is way up there, right? So for the political systems to adjust and kind of say, okay, computers are now a thousand times, a million times, and of course 2026 now a billion times better than people at seeing things about writing, about reading, and so forth. It's just not something that, you know, politicians or societies could really get their head around. Um, so actually back at that time, I. Uh, uh, had a talk that was on TED.com where I presented this slide where I described these problems. And a lot of people were saying, okay, income inequality is a problem. Let's have more education. And I, you know, of course, as soon as you think about it, you realize, well, education, it helps the people who are educated, but it actually speeds up the rate of technological development. So it doesn't solve the problem in some ways, or in very true ways, it makes it worse. Uh, a lot of people as, you know, in the kind of 2018, 2019, 2020, employment increased, the politicians responded in the only way they know how, which is to try and create more incentives to work, which in America basically means 
uh, reducing handouts. You know, so uh, the attempt, you know, in, in fact, when half the country could not add economic value because algorithms were better at them at everything that they could do, the approach of saying, well, let's reduce their entitlements to try and incent them to work more had the opposite effect of what it was hoped would do. All it just meant was that poor people got poorer faster. So the inequality got worse. Uh, in many parts of Europe, the same did not happen. In many parts of Europe, the idea of um, kind of equality and social justice and so forth were much more part of the culture. And so in those parts of the world, they responded to the uh, economic inequality by bringing in um, initially a negative income tax, which is basically, okay, if you can't add value to the economy, the, the government will go beyond a zero tax rate to a negative tax rate and actually start to pay you to help make your labor uh, economically additive. Uh, at some point you can then move to a basic living wage where you actually start to say, okay, well we now are in a post-scarcity world. And here in 2026 we recognize we're now in a post-scarcity world, right? We, we're all here rather than actually working because we don't need to actually work anymore, right? We can spend our time hanging out, chatting, you know, kind of intellectualizing, whatever else. Um, but it took us a while for people to realize that they, you know, didn't need to spend eight hours a day, every single day, working at a point when computers, you know, could, could increasingly do it all for us. Um, so, you know, there was this kind of gradual process and in some of the kind of more culturally sophisticated countries that kind of went more along this path and then in places like uh, the US which you know really don't like change that much it was more of a kind of try the things that don't help for a while wait till people get very angry and start shooting at things and then you know gradually adjust um, once you've had enough of that uh, it's not like uh, this was an idea people weren't talking about. You know, the idea of a basic income guarantee was something which you can find websites in 2016 talking about the importance of it. And indeed, you can even find places like Switzerland that in 2016 were, had, uh, were voting on this very question. So, uh, so you know, uh, this is, I mean, you know, it's all too late now, of course, but my basic uh, kind of narrative here is to say, hey, look, you know, a lot of people have been very surprised about the last 10 years of development. I don't think you should have been. Back in 2016, we could all see exactly what was coming and it just required us to open our eyes and be aware of it. So, um, thank you very much. Jeremy, thanks very much. We have 10 maybe a little longer, 10 minutes, a little longer for questions. It may not be enough. Um, all right, anyone want to kick us off here with the, let's go, uh, I'll come to you in a moment or two. Let's go to the gentleman there in the white shirt, uh, and then we'll go across the line. So I just want to marry your idea with the talk from yesterday, where we talk about you know, um, the application of data science for the greater good. And oftentimes, our understanding of greater good uses humanity as a reference point. But if deep learning creates such super intelligence in which what's good for humanities may not necessarily be good for machine. In that, in that regard, when you have machine that's more capable than humans, what's the ultimate mission for that, for that deep learning? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, back when I started in Lytic, people kind of asked me this question a lot, which was like, okay, it sounds like, like what you're trying to do is put doctors out of business. You know, are you actually bringing about the very kind of dystopia that you were warning people about? Yet at the same time in medicine, the fact of the matter is that in, in the large population centers, Indonesia, Brazil, China, um, India, uh, there is a 10x to 20x shortage of medical experts. So in those countries, most people in the world have no access to a doctor. It's not that they don't have access to medical technology. You know, China is now a bigger economy than the US um, and has been since 2016. Um, the, the issue is that there weren't doctors to interpret that data. 
So I, I think this is a really interesting like example or microcosm of your question, which is by bringing deep learning to medicine, you know, we're, we're bringing modern medical diagnostics to the four billion people who don't have access to it. Um, but yeah, at some point, it's also going to put some people out of a job. Um, so the trick is to realize that having a job is not in and of itself, like, that's not the goal, you know. The goal is to have a good life, right? And in fact, most people's jobs, if you look at the US employment statistics, are, uh, you know, were very menial, you know, it's more like salary chopping than, you know, uh, being a Berkeley uh, computer scientist. Um, so for most people, the idea of like saying, hey, you don't have to go into work every day and chop salary. Instead, you can spend your time with your kid or learning about philosophy or surfing or whatever would be like, okay, well, that's, that's great. So the idea is to kind of bring about a world where people can do what they want to do rather than what they have to do. Well, you know, deep, deep learning doesn't have a sense of like who it serves. It's, it's just a predictive algorithm, right? So uh, it's up to us to decide what we do with it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it can interpret language, it can interpret pictures, it can uh, interpret Go boards. Um, yeah, but it's entirely up to humans as to what we choose to do with that technology as to what problems we want to serve with it. So in my case, you know, I decided the problem I wanted to serve was to bring medicine to the four billion people that don't have it. Um, and this is kind of a question for the, the folks here who are, you know, interested in data science is, well, what are you going to, what are you going to do with it? You know, because at this stage, your skills are for now still in demand. Uh, and you know, most people, unfortunately, who learn data science skills use it for advertising technology or hedge fund trading or product recommendations. And, you know, I hope people that come through the Berkeley program might do other things, you know, because uh, there's a lot of data-driven problems that in solving them help humanity a hell of a lot. Thank you. I just, let, 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 let's take another couple. Do you want to respond to that? I want to take another couple of perspectives here from folks. Um, let's go to, you had a question here, do you want to follow on? Yes. No, yeah, in the red. Hi, um, I just had a question on, you'd shown a map uh, with the different countries having different sorts of uh, engagements. Uh, so just, I was quite interested in looking at India because that's where I come from. And you mentioned that uh, I mean, you predict that it's going to be completely agriculture-based. So my question is that aren't we pushing countries back on the development phase because the uh, focus has been to move away from agri and move into services and manufacturing in India? And are we, by using data science, pushing them back? No, it's not that India will become more agricultural. So in 2016, India is about 20% agriculture. Um, that data science causes that to decrease, in, not increase. Uh, data science is, uh, in 2016, already very widely used in agriculture and increasingly so. So there are companies that are doing, um, uh, automa you know, basically putting video cameras on the back of tractors to automatically identify kind of the optimal position of seedlings to identify, automatically identify, um, um, you know, things that uh, aren't wanted and killing them with little sprays of liquid nitrogen and you know there's a uh, uh, companies like uh, Descartes Labs which is a startup which is trying to uh, kind of identify high crop yield potential areas and so forth so yeah technology has always improved agricultural output decreased the need for humans so in somewhere like India India actually has an opportunity to take a different path you know, they kind of have this concept of technology leapfrogging, which is this idea that you don't have to go through every stage that America did or every stage that the UK did. You can take a different path. You can say, okay, um, a lot of these services jobs are quickly becoming redundant, so maybe India can be at the leading edge of 
you know, creativity-based jobs or mentoring-based jobs. Or, you know, there are certain jobs which are entirely about people engaging with people, you know, and uh, will, will never go away. Thank you. Let's, um, there you have a question there, you had your hand up early, so we'll take one here and then, yeah. Thank you, Jeremy, for the speech. Um, so I wonder, because you mentioned a lot of things um, computer can do. Computer can read and write, computer can Im even improve the algorithm. So looking into the future, say we are in 2026, as you mentioned, um, a lot of algorithms are fully developed. And then, so what's the human's role in yeah, human development? That's a great question. So here in 2026, it's obvious as to what turned out to be the answer to that question, which is there are certain things which humans don't appreciate computers doing. So when we go and watch uh, a football match, we still go and watch humans playing football because, you know, the attempts at creating robot football leagues were not successful because nobody gives a shit about watching robots play football. <laughs> uh, you know, the first robotic orchestra was a big uh, failure as well because nobody wants to watch robots playing violin, you know. These are the things which are all about what the human brain does, what it appreciates. And we've known from psych psychology research for a long time that the human brain gets a huge kick out of observing human performance. Um, we particularly get a kick out of it when that human performance is with somebody that's close to us, which is why when our daughter creates a, a, a pot, which by all quantitative metrics is a piece of shit, we still go, <laughs> that's a great pot, you know. Uh, or if it's somebody who is less well connected but is a famous Korean sculpture, then might, we might have a higher bar, but we still go, okay, that's also a great pot. But or else if a, if a machine creates the same pot, then we kind of go, I'm not interested. So, you know, hu you know uh, uh, human performance, um, there's also just humans enjoy engaging in activities and becoming good at them for their own sake. You know, like I, I don't practice surfing because I'm ever going to be the best surfer in the world. Uh, I practice surfing because I enjoy doing it and I enjoy the process of trying to get better at it. Um, there's lots of things that humans, you know, can only do either with themselves or with other humans. And so in a world where we don't have to work anymore, um, you can actually see that already if you look at, um, you know, pe people who retire, for example, they don't um, you know, the, the people who retire successfully are the people who go and spend their time on their passions or their hobbies or with their families or whatever. Um, work does not have to be the thing which, you know, is all that, all that matters. It's the, yes, a gentleman in the, in the centre there in the blue shirt. Hi, Jeremy. Thanks. This was super interesting and, like, it made me dream like, wow, thanks for the look back. Um, you mentioned lack of scarcity though, and I am really interested in that because something that worries me is like uh, physical scarcity, so water, mm. resources. Can you tell us what has happened mm. uh, in the last 10 years? Yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah so brief, brief history reminder, you know, modern history is something we don't always study as much as we should. So. Um, Let's go back a bit further, first of all, which is to the history of um, scarcity of energy. So before the Industrial Revolution, most people spent most of their time putting uh, energy inputs into processes or uh, guiding um, horses or beasts of burden as they put energy into processes. So people were, you know, moving, um, moving shuttles through weaving machines or they were, you know, um, helping horses go around and around to mill grain or they were out in the fields planting crops. The Industrial Revolution changed all that when um, it was realized that machines, engines, um, and then after that electricity, could uh, take stored energy and replace humans and horses in these, um, in these uh, processes. Eventually, even in the process of getting from point A to point B, the horse and cart was replaced by a car engine. The replacement of intellectual energy with computers, you know, was the next thing that happened and it followed a similar path. Uh, gradually, you know, uh, the intellectual inputs of people were replaced by computers in more and more places. And that did mean that where 
physical scarcity could be improved through intellectual endeavors, uh, we were able to rely on computers to help us. So the solar, um, you know, solar was already improving at a double exponential back in 2016. Uh, that rapidly improved. Um, but there were some things which just uh, fundamentally, you know, there was a, a shortage of, and you know, that's why increasingly we're seeing um, uh, things like asteroid mining becoming more and more popular. And in fact, even that was a, a thing back in 2016. Planetary Resources was a company that uh, was already formed for asteroid mining. So a lot of these problems are things that people had been working on solutions on for, you know, for a long time. Take, uh, okay, a chance for just one final question. Um, gentleman there, right at the back in the corner. Thank you. Do you see um, anti-discrimination practices that are applied now to models um, limiting the growth of deep learning, like uh, identifying the best applicants or who to lend money to, um, some of the things that the business world struggles with today do you think deep learning's growth will be stunted by that? Um, yeah, I mean, that and many related things. I mean, the biggest thing that I saw in medicine was the um, focus on data privacy and security. Um, the big problem there is that you can create a big story out of a single piece of data getting into the wrong hands. You know, and that can then be in the newspaper about this specific person who had this specific thing happen to them. But the fact that, you know, I, I believe that millions of people are dying each year unnecessarily because of the lack of data sharing in medicine is meaning that we can't build the diagnostic tools which otherwise we could. That doesn't get any press because you can't point at a specific person and they, that particular person, you know, this is their story and it would have been different. Um, so, you know, in general, kind of lots of areas of regulation hold back all kinds of machine learning. Um, uh, the particular one you mentioned, I experienced in a very odd way firsthand. I used to run an insurance pricing company. Um, not my proudest moment, but, uh, you know, um, there you go. Um, and we certainly dealt with these uh, kind of interesting questions about non-discrimination where a machine learning algorithm would come up with something using no data which was um, kind of, you know, there are certain data items you're not allowed to use and we wouldn't give those to the algorithm, but inevitably it would find other proxies for ways of saying, you know, this group of people crashes their car more often or this kind of area has more break-ins or whatever. So, you know, we really had a big challenge with trying to find ways to get our algorithm to fit within <laughs> the kind of, uh, requirements of the regulation. So, I mean, I, I don't know what the right answer is there because I also see that it is really important to make sure everybody gets a fair go. So, so I'm not saying we shouldn't have these laws, but I think it would be nice if there were more people who had a deeper technical understanding of the pros and cons were more involved in, in creating them. Okay. Right. Jeremy, thanks so much for uh, that view from 2026. <laughs>